So I'm excited about the topic today. The topic is, how do I become a magician? Now there's really two questions embodied in that one question. How do I become a magician? I'm thinking of how do you learn to do magic? But the other side of that coin is how do I become a professional magician? I'm not going to deal with that question in this in this particular video. I'm going to look at how do you become, how do you study magic? That's the question I'm trying to answer. How do I become a professional? Let's assume that you've been you've been studying magic for a long time and you love it and you've decided this is what I want to do with my life. Well, what you're making the decision to do is to become an entrepreneur. So the, the, the question, how do I become a professional magician, is the same question, how do I become an entrepreneur? It has to do with branding. It has to do with marketing. It has to do with sales. It has to do with understanding what your product or service is and who your marketplace is, where your marketplace is, and present, positioning yourself in that market marketplace. Uh, that's business. That's another side that, that maybe we'll deal with. I hope we do at some point. But I'm excited about today because I've been studying magic. I've been a student of magic since I was eight years old. I can remember my very first experiences with magic. I remember what happened. I remember how it, how it impacted me. And you know what? Here's the beautiful thing. I'm, a, I'm as enthusiastic about magic today including mentalism and all forms of magic. I'm as excited about it today as I was when I was eight years old. And that's special. And most magicians will say that to you. I've known people my entire life. Uh, when, when I first started studying magic, when I first went down to the magic shops, I met people that were my age, the age I am now then and I thought they were really old people you know because I was eight years old I was 11 I was 12 and these guys were 60 and 65 and 70 and so I thought wow they're you know um, but they had a, a huge impact on me and, and here's the thing they loved magic with a passion the way I did when I was eight and, and that is so true it, it holds true over a period of time so let's say that that however old you might be, you might be six, you might be eight, you might be 12, you might be 25, you might be 55, it doesn't make any difference. Uh, George Goebel once told me, you know, when the magic bug bites, it uh, it never lets up, and, and that's really true. So however old you might be, I think the principles pretty much hold true. Now we're living in a different age. <clears throat> Remember, when I was when I was eight years old, that was 1968. There was no such thing as an internet. Uh, so I couldn't Google it. You know, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't sit down at a keyboard and, and search for what I was looking for. You might today, you might go to YouTube and you might, you might Google in or, or type in, uh, how do I study magic? And you'll get a mess of videos. Uh, you might go to Google and do the same thing and you'll get a mess of articles and resources and, and so on. Uh, so you have advantages today that I didn't have when I was coming up, uh, but those advantages can be disadvantages as well. Uh, if, 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 if the only window on a world that you have is through the internet, you're, you're, only, you're, you're literally peeking through a window. You're not in the room, you're peeking through the window. And so there's something missing. And uh, I think that, that there's an illusion, uh, and this has to do with information in general. We're living in an information age, this is true. But don't be seduced by the illusion of easy access. Uh, it's one thing to understand how a trick is done. It's another thing to understand how to present that to an audience such that it's entertaining for them. Becoming a magician is not understanding how tricks are done. That's, that's a part of it, certainly. But becoming a magician is understanding how to pre then present that to someone else, to give it to someone else as a gift. Uh, that, that's what magic's all about. And you don't. it's hard to learn that on YouTube. Um, it's hard to learn that by doing a Google search. I'm going to give you some direction here um, that I hope will save you some time and give you some places to go and, 
and resources to pursue. Uh, I, I was eight years old, I believe, when I saw my first magician. Now, now I've, I've talked in other videos about the influence of my father, the influence of his father on him. Uh, my grandfather, Raymond Delman, was a magician. He was not a professional magician. He was an amateur magician, but he loved the craft. He loved the art. And uh, he was a traveling salesperson. He sold Wilcox and Gibbs sewing machines. Uh, and he would come home from selling and he would show the latest trick he learned to his two children, my Aunt Eleanor Pfeiffer and, uh, and my dad, uh, Gordon Delman. Uh, so, and my father, you know, he never learned how to do some of this stuff, but he would tell me about it as I grew up and, and I, I fell in love with my granddad and, and I was, I was in awe of my granddad and the wonders that he, he, uh, he presented to my dad who then presented to me, uh, verbally. <clears throat> and then of course my father, uh, was taken to the Blackstone show and, and so he understood what a big show was. And, uh, and, and later when I was coming up, I, I was a Cub Scout and he was the pack master. He was able to decide what the program was going to be for the pack meetings. And one evening he hired a magician and that magician's name was George Goebel. Uh, I don't think he knew. And I certainly didn't know at eight years old or nine years old that George Goebel was one of the greatest magicians that Baltimore has ever produced. Um, but we saw his show at a pack meeting and it was a wonderful show and, and the magic bug bit at that moment. I mean, I was hooked. Uh, but then later, a few years later, we saw him in a full evening show. We saw his full, uh, illusion show. Now I was thinking about, about the image of a magician and George, George believed that a magician should look like a magician. And what he meant by that was a goatee and uh, a, a tuxedo with tails, evening dress. Uh, historically, it was Robert Houdin who popularized evening dress as the, as the uh, official <laughs> uniform of the magician. Prior to Robert Houdin, uh, I think magicians were going for robes and, and, and uh, cone hats and all sorts of other types of things. But Robert Houdin came along and, and he, he um, uh, you know, what, what has become formal wear was, was more or less casual, not, not casual, but it was, it was evening wear during the, uh, the mid-Victorian period when he popularized it. And that kind of stuck. And then it was uh, Alexander Herman, I believe, who popularized the goatee. Now his, his father, Alexander Herman's father was a magician. He had a goatee, his brother had a goatee. So the whole family sort of did. <clears throat> but Alexander Herman was the first superstar of magic in the United States. And uh, he performed in the, in the late Victorian period. And I'm gonna do a little bit of, I'm gonna do a video on him and on his, his wife, uh, Adelaide Herman, who was, the f who was probably the first successful female magician. She, she performed on her own for 30 years. I'm gonna talk a bit more about her later. Uh, the reason I'm, I'm sharing this is because if you're coming up in magic today, you may not have that association with magic. Uh, the, 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 uh, the tuxedo with tails and the goatee. Uh, looking a little bit, uh, a little bit satanic, you know, um, uh, in, in the classical images of Satan with the, with that, that, the horn look and everything. And Blackstone has a famous, um, uh, image of himself where he's kind of profile and in the shadow, you can, you can see sort of a Luciferian type of, of, of shadow. Uh, these are associations that magic has had over a period of, of years and decades and, and even centuries. Uh, that doesn't mean that you, that, that it's in, in any way associated with, with Satan or the devil or anything like that. Uh, it's, it's not, but, but it's an image. And I'm just wondering if, for example, if you grew up on, uh, uh Chris Angel, you would have a whole different image of what a magician is. David Blaine, whole different image of what a magician is. These Doug Henning, uh, popularized, he, he, it was, George Goebel was my first major influence. And then there was Doug Henning. And Doug Henning, of course, was, if you don't know him, I, I get, please get to know him. He, um, he was kind of a hippie magician. He was very popular in the 70s. 
uh, maybe the late 60s, 70s, and uh, even early 80s. He, he continued his popularity. He did it in television shows, and uh, he really had a, an impact on me as well. Um, so, so magic really begins there. It begins with watching. Uh, now, there's two ways to watch, of course. You, you can watch on YouTube, and there's nothing wrong with that. But I would encourage you, if you have not seen a live magic performance, get out and see one. <clears throat> They're in the community. Uh, you can, for example, if, the, if the, uh, the local zoo is having an event, the local libraries are having an event, uh, always, there's always a show around someplace. Get out and see live magicians. There's nothing like it. You can watch it on YouTube, yes. You can enjoy it on YouTube, absolutely. You can watch it on television. But a live performance, it will change your life. It really will. So get out and see the live entertainers. Uh, uh, there, there is a difference. So it begins with watching. Watch as much as you can. Get exposed to as much as you can. And uh, I remember at eight years old, I, I saw George and I the, the, grew up on the stories that my dad told me and I wanted to pursue magic. So I, I, I asked and I asked and I asked. You know, when you're eight years old, you don't have a lot of options. You don't have money. You can't, can't go into a store and buy what you want. You, you ask your parents and uh, for Christmas one year, they bought me a magic kit. And I loved that thing. I had, you know, boxes with tricks in it and uh, a little booklet with, with five, 50 other tricks other than the props that are in the box. So I, I took that thing and uh, I learned every trick in the book, uh, literally every trick in the book. And one day I, I went to school. I was in the third grade. And I loved show and tell. I, I've always been a little bit of a ham. Uh, I've always been, I'm an, I'm an introvert. But, you know, introverts generally do enjoy uh, public speaking and public performance. And it, it makes us nervous, but we enjoy it. And I always have, as, as far back as I can remember, I've always loved getting up in front of people and performing, regardless of what it was I was doing. And I love show and tell, and I always was looking for something to, to bring in, and so I, I brought my, my magic show. And I told the teacher, you know, it's going to be a little bit longer than, than the normal show and tell. And she was okay with it. So I set up and I started performing. And uh, there's only about 30 kids in my class. But one of the young, uh, young boys in my class got the same magic kit for Christmas. And so that kid sat there and he called out the secret of every trick the minute I did it. Uh, and so I would I would perform a trick and he would say this is how it's done and I go and I perform another trick and this is how it's done and, and so <laughs> that was my first performance experience. Now now that held me well because you know what that taught me was if I'm going to present tricks from a magic kit I'm going to have to put a twist on them such that they don't look the same they're not presented the same it's got to be a little bit different. Uh, I still don't like the public exposure of secrets. I think it's bad for magic. It's bad for performance. It certainly was bad for that particular show. I remember years later, <coughs> years later, <coughs> I was doing uh, what they call walk around magic. It was at a restaurant and I walked up to a table and uh, one of my favorite tricks then now always is, is the brainwave deck. Yeah, I believe it was developed by Di Vernon. Wonderful, uh, wonderful effect. What, what basically happens here is you can ask a spectator to think of any card. Uh, they think of a card and that particular card is reversed in the pack. And, and it's the only one with, a, with an odd color as well. If it's a blue back pack, it's a red back card that's reversed. And it's their card. It's, it's an amazing effect. I love it. Uh, but there was an amateur magician at the table, and sure enough, you know, he called out. Now, now here's the thing. There's lots of different ways to accomplish an effect. So, um, you don't have to use the, 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 the method from the dealer. You can create your own method, and there's other methods that, that you'll be exposed to eventually. So that the person who thinks they know, you can hand them the deck, and they don't know. Uh, and that's that's precious when that happens, uh, <clears throat> but that's that's a, that's a digression from my purpose. First of all, watch, watch every performer you can. Watch on YouTube. Yes, 
Uh, go to shows live as much as you can. Uh, secondly, join a magic club. Now you've got three options. Uh, you've got the local clubs that usually are sponsored by a magic dealer. Now dealers are disappearing and I'm going to talk about dealers in a moment. Uh, just like Amazon has impacted the book selling industry such that independent booksellers are vanishing, sadly, <coughs> so it is with magic dealers. Um, the, the internet has, has taken what was remote and brought it straight into your living room. And that's a wonderful blessing for all of us. But it has also reduced the dependency that we might have on brick and mortar shops. You know, whatever our interest might be, it's very easy to go online and order what you want rather than getting in the car and driving to a, a store and going in and purchasing and maybe they won't have it in stock. But there's an advantage to a magic shop that Amazon will never have and internet dealers will never have and that is the camaraderie and the coaching and the mentoring that goes on in an environment like that. Um, so get to a magic shop and see if they have a club and join it. The other clubs, and, and I know there's one in your area, this, this here is the publication of the International Brotherhood of Magicians. This is the Linking Ring magazine. Uh, it, when you join the International Brotherhood of Magicians, you get this subscription for free. Now there are chapters everywhere. There's a chapter right here in Baltimore, Maryland, and there's a chapter where you are, wherever that might be. Um, <clears throat> this is a great place to meet other magicians. What typically happens at a meeting, you know, it, you, have a, you have a club meeting, you have a business meeting, uh, and then there's performances. And so whatever it is you're practicing or working on, you get up and you perform for your fellow magicians. And they, they might critique you, they might not, depending on what you want. Uh, they might help you, they might not, depending again on, on what you want. Uh, you can certainly ask for input and feedback and, and get it. The International Brotherhood of Magicians. <clears throat> Search them out online, you can join um, remotely, you can do that. But uh, I still prefer to do this the old fashioned way. Figure out where the local chapter is meeting. You can do that from their from their uh, from their website. I'll put the links below. Um, get over to a meeting. Contact the members before or a member before you get there, and and let them uh, let them bring you into the meeting. Typically, in these groups, I don't know if it's still the truth because I've been a member for a long, long time. But it used to be that you had to get signatures from other members to join and, and they're very liberal about signing you up so don't you worry about it just go ahead and do it IBM the other <coughs> the other club that is very very good is the Society of American Magicians this is their publication MUM Magic Unity Might MUM uh, this has been published for God only knows how long uh, again I have uh, I have enjoyed the publication over a period of decades. Uh, it's, it's a great publication as well. This is the publication of the Society of American Magicians. I was actually more active in the Society of American Magicians than I was in the IBM. I say was because I'm not as active anymore as I used to be. I, my, my focus now is on performance and on performing for lay audiences as opposed to magicians. But uh, you know, I love magicians, and I certainly probably should get back there and, and, and contribute a little bit more. When I used to be a member of Assembly 6, uh, I used to produce shows all the time. I got the guys out, and I got them working. Uh, you know, because my... There are magic hobbyists, and that's great. You know, that all they want to do is collect magic and talk about magic and join and maybe present a trick at the, at the club meeting. <laughs> but uh, I've always loved to perform for audiences, uh, lay audiences, and... So that's what I did when I was active in the clubs. I, I produced the shows. Um, <clears throat> but any anything you want to do, uh, any any type of magic you want to pursue, you can do it in the conjunction with the clubs. So do that. Join a club. Local clubs, the Society of American Magicians and the IBM, the International Brotherhood of Magicians. And Brotherhood, by the way, does not exclude women. It does not. 
uh, women are, are welcome. And listen, let me tell you something. There's some great female performers. Uh, Adelaide Herman performed at the at the tail end of the Victorian age and uh, into the 1920s, and she was fantastic. And there are uh, there are uh, it's 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 not uh, it, it's not gender biased by any means. Um, yeah, women do fantastic work, and and uh, and they're part of the clubs. So come on out. Uh, those those are the clubs. Five, the, uh, the third third uh, hang out at a magic shop. I mentioned this before about going to magic shops to find uh, a club. Uh, again, the brick and mortar shop is disappearing, and, and that's that's a shame. But uh, you know, I, I had some great dealers over a period of time, and I've, I've mentioned these before on this video. Um, uh, Phil Thomas of the Yogi Magic Mart was my mentor for many many years. I met Bob Tilford at the Yogi Magic Mart. I, I met him again at the Funhouse Magic Shop, <clears throat> and then there was Denny Haney. And I've talked about Denny Haney, and there's a video uh, on Denny because he passed recently. Um, these guys were my mentors and friends. And, and, and this is true from the time I was eight to today. And uh, the, so the brick and mortar shop is extremely important. And, um, you know, it, it's magic shops are the one place where loitering is acceptable and even desirable. Um, I used to spend whole days. I mean, when I was a kid, my dad would drop me off at the Yogi Magic Mart in on Saturday morning. I would run errands for Phil Thomas all day long. I would learn some tricks over the course of the day. I would present those tricks at a club meeting at night, and then dad would come back and pick me up sometimes midnight. So um, I was there all day long, and and it's uh, you can do that. You can you can hang out at a magic shop, and you never know who's going to walk in. Uh, I, I mentioned Don Tini in another video. He's hanging out in a magic shop on 42nd Street in New York City. In walks Harry Houdini, his 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 uh, his meant his um, idol. So you just you just never know. Get to a magic shop, hang out there, talk to the dealer. Uh, the other thing now now Phil Thomas used to say, "Read books, my boy. Read books." I can remember. He, imagine being eight years old. And being told, if you want to be a magician, you need to study the Tarbell Course in Magic. <laughs> this, folks, is the Tarbell Course in Magic. I am not kidding you. Um, volume 1, Volume 2, Volume 3, uh, they, they are affordable. They're not expensive. Uh, and what you get in here is, is just gold. It's gold. But let me tell you, it is hard to, to make your way through... Uh, Harlan Tarbell, when he developed this uh, this course, he didn't come out of the shoot like this. This was a correspondence course. So you you uh, applied, and he would send you a lesson, and another lesson, and another lesson. And over a period of time, you know, you you took in the whole thing. To buy this set and to read through it is daunting. Now I have some suggestions. If you are starting. I mean, it's ground zero, okay? You're starting. <clears throat> Phil Thomas told me I needed to read that, but he directed me toward this. Now, this isn't, I don't know what happened, but I lost my original. I had one of the first original Mark Wilson Course in Magic uh, books. Now, the first one, let me tell you about it. It was a spiral bound thing. So you opened it up and it would sit flat and you could study. Take a look at that. The way it's illustrated. Step one, step two, step three, step four, step five. You just follow through and it, it's, it's, it's a great way to learn. Now contrast that with the typical... I'm just going to open any place, okay? See what I mean? Um, you got to read the description and try to visualize what's happening and maybe get the props and kind of work through it on your own uh, to sort of get, and that's the way most, this is the way most magic books are written. Uh, so, so there's a challenge, and I understand why kids today are saying, wait a minute, I'm not going to do that, I'm going to look on YouTube. Um, the, problem, the problem with when, you, when you're looking at on YouTube and you're seeing another performer doing it, 
they're presenting it with their personality, their style, their handling. Uh, and if you imitate that, you're just going to be another clone of everyone else on YouTube. It's one of the values of reading books is that it, you develop your own style. Uh, even, even when you read something as detailed as this, that's giving you each step with a drawing so that you can walk through and, lear and learn to perform. Uh, but this was what I actually started with. And I got to tell you, I still do material from this book. I do material from this too, but I, I, the, the, the stuff in here is golden. Uh, now, you can't get the original anymore. <clears throat> the one that was spiral bound and it came with props. That was really cool. Can't get that, but you can get this. You can get it on Amazon. You can get it from a dealer. Uh, it's not expensive. The Mark Wilson Course in Magic. And what I like about beginner magic books, especially for beginners, is that here, the first, the first section is on card magic. And then the second section is on money magic or coin magic, rope magic, silk magic, impromptu magic, mental magic or mentalism, uh, make at home magic, billiard balls, cups and balls, and, uh, and magical illusions. Now I got to tell you something. Um, the first couple of shows I ever did, pretty much all the material came from this book. And then when I was in college... I was studying broadcasting, and uh, we were producing a variety show, and we needed something to spice up the show. I, uh, I did a couple of illusions, big illusions, from this book, and they killed, man. I, I had people, they were like, cut, let's do it again, and I, I would do the illusion again and again, and people couldn't figure out how it was done. You know, I was doing it over and over and over again. Uh, to get the right angles and the right lighting and so on and so on. And, and, and people were just astounded. So, uh, awesome book. Don't neglect it. The Mark Wilson Course in Magic. If I had to tell you to buy just one book to get started, buy this one. Buy this one. Now, <clears throat> let me make Tarbell a little easier for you. First of all, it's, it's if you take one lesson at a time and you inch your way through it, it's not that bad. Really, it isn't. Um, but you have an advantage today that I never had, and I wish I did. <clears throat> and his name is, is Dan Harlan. <clears throat> Dan Harlan has been producing videos for Penguin Magic. I'm going to put the link below so you can find it. Penguin Magic for a, a very long time now. And his, his, his dream, his goal, his ambition is to work through this entire course. What he's doing is, he's reading the lesson, he's learning the magic, and he's enhancing what's already in here with his own body of knowledge. So he's bringing a whole lot more to the table, and he's producing these videos. And um, one video right now, uh, this is March of 2019, I think if you bought one video, which is the equivalent of one lesson. These are many, many lessons. Uh, it's about 25, 30 bucks, something like that. If you buy 10, $10 a piece, you buy 10 for 100 bucks, uh, sounds like a lot of money. It's not. Uh, let me tell you something. The, each lesson is roughly two hours, okay? So you're getting a demonstration of the effects in here, as well as a complete and thorough explanation of the effects in here. Now, there's more to the Tarbell than, than learning magic tricks. Uh, Tarbell spent a great deal, he, does, he goes into the history of magic, he talks about performance styles, he talks about specializing in various types of magic. Uh, there, there's a whole lot of extra stuff that you're not going to get necessarily from watching Dan Harlan. Uh, so, I think you need to have the books in your library, you need to make your way through them. But start with Mark Wilson, work your way over here, uh, and, and work down through here. But you do have Dan Harlan today that I didn't have growing up, and I really recommend that you check him out. At least go to the, the link below, and take a look at some of the trailers, and decide if that's something you might want to do. <clears throat> Alright, so what have we talked about? <clears throat> we talked about watching other performers. We talked about joining a magic club. 
We talked about hanging out at magic shops. We talked about reading books, especially these two, if you're a beginner. But once you get past the beginning phase <clears throat> and you've, you've <clears throat> exposed yourself, I, I like to think of it as, a, as an undergraduate degree. In undergraduate school, you're not necessarily supposed, now I'm a liberal arts kind of guy, you're not necessarily supposed to, to major, uh, concentrate entirely in one area. It's better to spread yourself out, to study a wide variety of subjects so that you learn where your passions are. See, very few people are born knowing what their passion is. Uh, and the same is true in magic. I mentioned in this book a lot of different kinds of magic in this as well. Are you an illusionist? That is, are, do you do the big show on stage? Are you a mentalist? Do you, do you read minds? Um, do you like coin magic? Do you like card magic? <clears throat> All these are different branches of speciality, specialty. And uh, once you begin to specialize, I can direct you there too, because I, I've had every specialty over a, over a 50 year career. I've studied everything, so I, I pretty much know where to go once you begin to specialize. But that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about rank beginners here. Uh, watch as much as you can. Join the magic club. Hang out at the magic shop. Read the books. And finally, perform. Perform. You will get to know yourself. You will get to know audiences. You will get to know how, how the things you read go over. <clears throat> whether or not they actually work. By work, I mean, did it provide a sense of wonder and joy for your audience? Because if it didn't, you know, either you've done something wrong or, and you can tweak that and make it better, and you get a sense for this over time. You know, when, you, when I perform something for the first time, I watch, and I, I, can, I know if the, if the concept that I had in my head was just off base, and I just trash it, or it wasn't off base, that my performance needs to be tweaked, something needs to be adjusted, and over a period of time in performances, that thing gets better and better and stronger and stronger. That's usually the way it works. But, but growth in magic is this uh, synergy of study, practice, rehearsal, and performance. And if you take performance off the table, it's, you know... Uh, it's difficult to develop as a performer if you're not performing, right? Uh, you got to get out there. Now, now, here's what I suggest, too. I think a lot of young magicians are too anxious to make money. Uh, you should be anxious to perform. You know, take, take the opportunities you can take, especially when you're beginning and you're untested and you don't know what you're doing. Uh, volunteer. Volunteer at uh, nursing homes. Volunteer at uh, orphanages. Volunteer at hospitals. Uh, volunteer to go out and, 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 and serve and contribute. And you'll grow. And, and you'll develop. And your love will develop. And you'll begin to, oh, I like this and I don't like that. And I'm going to specialize over here. And that, all that will evolve over time. So folks, uh, I hope you've enjoyed this little discussion about how to become a magician. And uh, I'm a mentalist today, and mentalism is a special branch of magic that specializes in mind reading and, and uh, mental or psychic effects. That's what I do. It's what I enjoy doing. It's what I specialize in. Uh, when I was a kid, I remember saying to Phil Thomas, I'm, here I am, I'm, I'm 10 years old, right? I want to be a mentalist. I want to be a mind reader. Phil Thomas said, nobody's going to take you seriously as a 10-year-old mind reader. Well, I'm in my 50s now, so, uh, so it, it, people can take me seriously. Uh, but honestly, you, you could be a 10-year-old mind reader. I've seen them. I've seen them, folks. And they're good. Uh, wh whatever you love, do it. Pursue it. You get this one life, folks. You get today. You don't necessarily get tomorrow. If you love it, do it. I hope this provides you a little bit of a roadmap. Thank you very much for joining me. And hey, don't forget to subscribe. We'll see you next time.